Hey everybody, this is Dr. David Walker. And I have some good news, and then I have some greater news. Here's the good news. Beyond the Culture has just finished season two. That's right, we have finished our second season of Beyond the Culture, and we ha now have over 50 episodes for you to listen to. Now, for those of you who have been listening to us each and every week, I want to take the time to say thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to the show. Thank you for downloading the episodes. Thank you for watching us each and every week as we bring you our podcast, Beyond the Culture. Now, somebody may be looking at this and you may say, well, I haven't downloaded the show. I haven't subscribed. Well, listen. You can do it right now. Go to iTunes, Spotify, Google, or wherever you watch or listen to your podcast. And I want you to subscribe to Beyond the Culture. Then I want you to go to our YouTube channel, Dr. David M. Walker, where you can subscribe to the show on YouTube. And then make sure you click that little bell, that little notification to let you know each week when I upload a new episode. So again, I wanna thank you for tuning in and watching Beyond the Culture each week. Now, here's what I wanna do. I wanna go back into season two and give you some highlights of the guests that came on each week to give us wisdom and to inspire us and to encourage us. I just wanna go back and just give you some, some highlights, but listen, if you remember, I said I have greater news, but I'm going to give you the greater news on the other side of the highlights. So here are some of the highlights of season two of Beyond the Culture, and I'll see you on the other side. Literally laid in the bed and I was praying and singing myself well. And I knew I had to come out of that and be better than I was before. And I, I, but I had to dig way deep to find what I knew was already in me. And so when you're faced with obstacles, that's what you have to do. You've got to dig deep, find that tenacity inside of you that says, no matter what, I am going to push through because I got to come through the other side. Just tell me you about know. one of the best journeys that you took and, you know, you know, most rewarding, most impactful, longest distance. I don't know. Just give me a story about one of your journeys that you went on with the food truck. Uh, the longest distance would probably be Waikiki, Hawaii. Wow. I was in Honolulu for, uh, I was presenting at a conference for American Studies. And there's a food truck there called um, Iron Grill. And it's a hibachi type of food truck. So that would definitely be my longest distance. I, I say that to the young people and they all click when I say that. I said, how many have ever read a book or a chapter in a book? And after you read it, it's like, what did I just read? Exactly. So, and, and I'm, I'm letting them know that's okay. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong. Just go over it again. That's I right. said, I've had that same thing. So my what works for me is, like I said, there's nothing wrong with your brain. You just learn different. And for me, you, you said that you like to be accessible. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you how I came across Dr. Schrader. Oh. <laughs> I'm, oh. on, I'm on LinkedIn. Oh. <laughs> and, and over a series of days and weeks, I see this lady who's the president of Kingsborough Community College all over the city at this young person's house, that person's young person's house, telling them about community college down in Brooklyn. And I'm saying she's everywhere. I've never seen a, co a college professor everywhere. So, so it seems that that has been a part of your marketing plan. How do you, you know, work with your clients? I know you, 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 you are, uh, you teach, you mentor authors and speakers. Just tell us how you work with your clients. So one of the main things with any of them, they have to have a brand. So I help them with their branding. So that is depending on where they are, each client I work with, we put together a proposal, what it is there, their goals are, and then we devise a strategy. So for instance, if it is Dr. Cindy Trim and she has a new book coming out, what is, 
where she's starting from will be different from someone who doesn't have a brand name. So depending on where they are is where we would start and put together a proposal. But for the most part, we're writing messaging for them. We're writing press releases. We're pitching them to the media. Okay. The media will pick them up. And then on the back end, hopefully their digital marketing is in place where that will convert into clients, convert into readers, convert into members, whatever it is their goal is. So primarily it is really getting the message out about them into the world based on where they are. So because you said that powerful word expectations, right? And I know that we all walk around with silent expectations, not only of ourselves, but of others. And what we really learned about that freed us up a long time ago, Dr. Walker, is that expectations that are not mutually agreed upon are invalid. Mm. So what does that mean? That means two people need to come together in agreement of this expectation right in order for it to be valid so if that means that if i'm walking around with an expectation of my wife that she has not agreed upon right null and void exactly. but when the two parties come together expectations that are mutually agreed upon are valid and acceptable so um one other piece when we talk about space right i think is very important um we also talk about the image of who is perceived to be in a certain space Okay. So we talked a little bit earlier, but then you introed about Mr. Floyd mm -hmm. and Mr. Floyd's um, situation where he literally had police officers that thought he was in the wrong place and that he didn't need to be there. Right. 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 When we think about what that means for certain groups of people, right? For black people in this country in particular, we're never seen as people who are supposed to belong in any space. Wow. So we have been we have been looked at, even though we've we've uh, um, contributed a lot to building the country. Mm -hmm. We're still looked at as people who are infringers of on space. But you were quoted as saying, and I want to quote you. Yeah, yeah. You were quoted as saying, Illinois is taking a step in the right direction, but true reparations are a direct monetary payment for the descendants of slaves. Yes. Talk no about, about the interview. Talk about your book. Well, the interview that you're talking about was um, was very, very timely and very, very uh, insightful to, and it was it was centered around what happened in Illinois during that time, which again I actually know um, um, the uh, alderman who who did that, and you know we've had some you know back and forth about it, but she she basically um, she took a step in the right direction, uh, okay. alderman. She took a step in the right direction, but I'm coming strictly from a biblical perspective. Right. My my perspective of of, you know, reparations is is from the biblical base and, and direct monetary payments is the blueprint or the example or the methodology that God has given us when it comes to the uh, the uh, re repairing of of the oppressed that have gone through any type of oppression. We'll get into that. And what did that lead to? That led to what I call the granddaddy of all crime bills, the crime bill in 1994, which led to the largest expansion of the federal death penalty in modern times, the gutting of habeas corpus, the, the evisceration of the exclusionary rule, the trying of 13 year olds as adults, the cutting out of Pell educational grants for prisoners, the institution of the federal three strikes law, the refusal to address the crack powder disparity, and and 100,000 new cops on the street, which actually has led to what all the stuff that we see today, but a whole lot of money to states to build a whole lot more prisons, to lock up a whole lot of more black folk. And that is what led to what we call the whole era of mass incarceration that we find ourselves in uh, today. So now, I know you didn't think that I was going to overlook this and miss this part of the interview. Okay. Uh, Miss Black Fit and Fine. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Tell us what inspired you to become, to enter a beauty yes. pageant in your 60s, mm -hmm. and then you had enough nerve to go ahead and win the pageant. Yes, what? yes. Tell us about it. Um, David, you know, I did that at probably one of the darkest periods of my life. I had just, you know, I was sharing with you about my family losses and I was still very much grieving and really in this fog and, and Pam Perry 
And you know Pam Perry. Sure. You've interviewed her on yes. Beyond the Culture. And yes. Pam Perry, you know, marvelous Pam Perry. She suggested to me that I enter this contest, this beauty pageant, Miss Black Fit and Fine. And I said, girl, are you crazy? Why would I do that at my age? And what, why am I going to do this? And she said, no, you need to do this. She said, because I know how you want to, you know, you're, you want this vibrant life and you're working hard to make it work for you and reimagine and redo. She said, this is something you should do. Step outside your comfort zone. Our, our uh, viewers like doubled and tripled in how many weekly viewers we had. And it became really one of the greatest seasons of our church. Wow. We we expanded like crazy during a time when nobody was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's crazy. <laughs> it, it, it is crazy. <laughs> you, 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 you expanded the church while nobody was coming. <laughs> while nobody, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's that's powerful. That is powerful. My, you know, as you were talking, I was I was smiling inwardly <laughs> because I went through the training. And I, exactly. I am a CMET grad and um, alumni. Was, an alumni. Yeah, yeah. It was it, it was it's an outstanding program for any person who's who wants to uh, launch out into you know entrepreneur entrepreneurial pursuits and to be successful in business. And you guys uh, uh, give quality training, resources that, that really can give uh, uh, an entrepreneur a strong foundation to launch out into a business. So how, how is it going? And just tell, tell us some of the impact that the uh, organization is having, well, other than graduating me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that's great impact because I graduated. So go see me. <laughs> I love it. And it's, a, as you say, a collateral damage to family. So talk about that because that's very important. So collateral damage was a term that my husband came up with when I was, I, I was hosting a room for a period of time on Clubhouse called Has Starting a Business Caused Damage in Your Relationship or Caused a Problem? Mm -hmm. in your relationship. And I'll circle back to what I mentioned earlier that I have been an entrepreneur's wife many more years than I have been an entrepreneur. Okay. And so oftentimes I find that when my husband and I are mentoring up and coming entrepreneurs, I find myself sometimes speaking to the supporting spouse and less to the entrepreneur themselves and what to expect when your spouse is about to take the leap or you guys have jointly decided that your family, because it's not just the person seeking the business or pursuing that business. It's the entire family. Stewardship. Then the next thing I talk about is ownership. Well, what we've talked about is, you know, I tell, hey, all of us own things, but do we own the right things? Yeah. So it's about owning assets. Assets do basically two things. They appreciate and value, and they give you cash flow. So we're looking at, okay, as opposed to me buying a, a brand new car right off the bat, shouldn't I maybe think about trying to invest some property? Right. And if I, if I get enough property or other assets, you know, I'll, believe me, I'll have a nice car eventually. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it will be the right way. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, I, I'm a I'm a big proponent of ownership. So whether it's real estate, you know, us, you, nowadays so many things you can own, people own businesses, people own intellectual property, royalties, and all I mean it's sure. tip, but just really having an ownership mentality. I was watching something yesterday and they were talking about um it was some 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 artist and the artist was either offered fifty thousand dollars up front or ownership in the film. Uh -huh. And the person ended up uh, turning down fifty thousand and took the ownership, and then ended up making three million as opposed to fifty thousand. And so, really, how do we how do we instill in people an ownership mentality? We can't filter and pump our own blood through, and we got to get a dialysis to take it out clean and then put put it back in. It comes in, but it drains us in the process, right? It drains you in the process we should be able to connect to him to life 
and be our own source of experience of happiness, joy, mm -hmm. fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And when we can, when I can't be happy, it's okay for you to be my leader, Dr. David. It's okay for you to be my father in the spirit. It's okay for you to be my pastor, my big bro. But if I can't function, mm. I can't if I can't make it at all. That I'm that's a di dialysis. Right. And you can keep me alive on the machine, but that's not how we were created. That that's wasn't right. the design. That's right. You know, and so if I could do it all over again, I would go back and have be it wouldn't be one thing I would change. It would be a series of conversations to encourage me to sit down and get connected so you can be whole. And I didn't know that for so long, man. That was a big part of my journey. If you cannot engage people, you will not retain people, and by, you definitely won't get the most out of them as a leader if you don't have what I call cultural intelligence. And mm. what I do with this concept is a really simple term. It means, number one, I appreciate and value those that are different than me. I'm a curious learner. Uh, I'm an active listener. I develop deeper understanding through questions, and then ultimately I'm willing to adapt or make adjustments in order to be effective at creating positive cross-cultural relationships with people that are different from me. And I think that's so incredibly important because it affects our decisions, it affects uh, how we lead, it affects how we treat people, it affects the organizational culture that we create. I mean, there's so much that is in, that is, that is, that is that is impacted by our awareness when it comes to diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. That is absolutely incredible. And so, wow, what a fantastic season, season number two. Now, if you remember, I told you that on this side. I was going to give you greater news. Well, the greater news is that Beyond the Culture is coming back for season number three. Yep, we're going to launch our third season later on in the summer or late August. We'll be back with season number three. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to iTunes. I want you to go to Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. And I want you to subscribe to Beyond the Culture. I want you to go to my YouTube channel at Dr. David M. Walker and subscribe to the video portion of our podcast. And that way, when season three comes along, you'll get notified of our upcoming season. Once again, I want to thank everyone for the time that you have set aside to listen to our show every week and i guarantee you that season number three is going to be outstanding take care